All right. So um, welcome everybody to the California Small Farm Conference. If you are looking for the uh, Grazing Beyond the Fence Line workshop, you are in the right place. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. A big thanks to our panelists today. Um, this is being recorded. So for those of you um, who are going to be missing it or didn't have the chance to catch it live, uh, this will be available on CAF's website and our YouTube channel. I just want to give a really big uh, props to our sponsors who made this year's event possible. Um, so if you haven't already, visit Swing by the Virtual Expo Hall. You can learn about some of our favorite companies and organizations that are all here to serve um, our family farm community uh, throughout California. So check the chat uh, box and you'll see links to, to that. Um, also, uh, this year's event has been made free. Um, we want to make sure that this important content is available to uh, everyone. Um, but if you're able to, um, we encourage you to give a donation. Um, there'll be a link as well in the chat box, uh, an opportunity to help keep this event going and also to make this event accessible to more people. Um, so take a moment and check out those links there. Um, and without further ado, um, we're going to go ahead and dive in here. Um, so first, before we get started on the video and the panelists, I want to get an idea of who is in the room here. So I'm going to launch a poll here. And for those of you watching at home, um, take a moment to just answer this question. And let's see um, if we're talking about, uh, do we have contract grazers? Um, are you running a livestock business, a rancher, um, and you're just curious about contract grazing? Um, maybe you're an aspiring grazer, um, or are you a landowner or a land manager seeking or curious about having contract grazing on your land? Lastly, if you're just curious about this topic more generally, um, go ahead and let us know there. So just that one question, and we'll see who's in the room. All right, so let's take a look at who we have here with us. It looks like a lot of curious people. So uh, as you can see, about 50%, uh, uh, half the folks here in the room are just curious, um, although we do have uh, a few aspiring grazers, um, land managers and land owners, and uh, a small handful of uh, folks who are actually doing contract grazing. So. Um, to those of you here, uh, welcome. Um, so today's topic is all about contract grazing. Grazing is uh, typically associated with a piece of land, um, but there's also a number of benefits and opportunities to uh, moving uh, animals throughout the throughout multiple properties, fire mitigation, e ecological services, and you're going to hear a lot more about that. Um, we wanted to start today's uh, workshop with a really beautiful video that kind of explores um, the long legacy of grazing and uh, moving from one land base to another. So, um, Anna, do you want to cue that up and we'll watch the film? There are times when our landscape needs disturbance to stay healthy. As shepherds, we give attention. So, um, for the most part, the uh, sweetgrass grow. We tend and relate to the unspoken parts of the world. As shepherds, we learn and embody how to be of service. As shepherds, we become storytellers. We seek to highlight the connection to place, a place of inclusion, nourishment, and abundance. A place that can heal the sense of separateness that we feel. We are reminded daily 
of the reflective and transformative power of land. For the vast majority of people, this power from land and connection to place is not available and has been taken away forcibly and with intent. Self-identity is deeply tied to a sense of place and without proper ground, it is impossible to grow roots and to heal wounds. Without roots, new growth is not imaginable. We are here to nurture new growth in all of its forms. We are here to share this power of connection with those that seek it and with those that don't know it exists. We are here to honor the importance of being seen, recognized, and welcomed in all of its nuance. Let us show the wisdom, strength, and resiliency of the earth for those who seek its guidance. It is our responsibility as shepherds to speak of the love we have found and the privilege of being land-based and in having a space in the world to share from. It is our responsibility to nurture this connection with others. To facilitate access to land, to give space for others to lead, to share, and help create a sense of belonging beyond ownership, borders, or nations. Let us inspire one another to evolve into something we can't stop loving. That was great. Um, thanks for sharing that video. So we're going to be talking today uh, not just about the, the beauty and the poetry of this lifestyle, but also um, what does it actually take? Um, what does it actually mean? And how do you build a, a, a livelihood um, around this practice? What does it mean for landowners? What does it mean for uh, grazers themselves? Uh, and then what does it mean for our communities at large? Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Kaiser. Um, She's an incredible uh, community member here in Sonoma County, um, working with the Fiber Shed um, and Wild Oak Hollow. She's a really a leader in regenerative agriculture and community organizing um, and really bringing all the aspects um, of grazing and land management in a way that's truly holistic. Um, so it's, uh, uh, again, my pleasure um, to introduce you to Sarah. Sarah is going to introduce the panel and lead today's conversation. So Sarah, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Evan. That was a great introduction. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here. I'd love to thank the panelists. They are three of the most interesting people I know, and I'm really excited for everyone to hear their different projects and the way they're doing it because they do it very uniquely. And it's nice to have such different perspectives. I am, again, kind of the moderator, so I won't be saying a lot, but I will be speaking a little bit to my model of community grazing projects in which I help rural residential communities create their own grazing with their own animals and bring them together as a community in which they connect through the animals on their land. And I'll speak to that a little bit as well. But with no further ado, as we 
this next 50 minutes are going to go very quickly. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our special panelists and read their bios, and then we'll begin to go into some questions. So Brittany Cole Bush, aka Cole, is an agrarian entrepreneur, advocate, educator, and voice for the next generation of practitioners on the land. With livestock promoting viable locations in agriculture, climate beneficial production of food and fiber, and proactive land stewardship. In 2020, she launched Shepherdess Land and Livestock in Ojai Valley in Ventura County. Shepherdess Land and Livestock provides prescribed grazing services, technical assistance, training, and small scale wool production. She is also the lead coordinator in the Ojai Valley Community Supported Grazing Program collaboration with the Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council and is ruminating on the development of a regional collective of grazers and value aligned service providers. She is thrilled to be building her own thriving place-based prescribed grazing business that places livestock back on the roads, valleys, and hillsides and utilizes traditional pastoral herding practices to move animals in tandem with the rhythms of the land. Again, pretty magnificent people on this panel. <laughs> Thanks, Cole. And next is the lovely Guido of True Grass Farms. Um, Trugress Farms is a family-owned operation, operated farm located four miles east of the Pacific Coast and tucked within the coastal valleys of Northwest Marin County. He belongs, his farm, his community, his family belong to the Estero San Antonio watershed where each day they dedicate themselves to creating a more harmonious relationship with the land and to their community and to the future of the ecosystem. Guido is a cow whisperer an ecological grazer, land tender, and sylvan protector. He's known for his love of oaks, but also lasagna, red wine, and great hospitality. Thanks, Guido. And John Roche is another very interesting model, and I'm so glad you're here. Has an, he has an extensive background in animal husbandry and land stewardship, as well as firefighting and fire prevention. He has been utilizing goat grazing for the past five years in clearing defensive spaces for homes and neighborhoods in West Marin County. As part of his business, John Roche Services, he specializes in small scale custom grazing with an eye for holistic land management and big picture stewardship. And just a quick introduction of me, I began um, with starting my own community grazing project called um, Pengrove Grazing Project in which I started moving my animals around the neighborhood and serving my neighbors. And what was great is we became a community. We started doing barbecues at the end of the grazing season. People got connected to the land. They got connected to their neighbors. And it was just a great project, which has now spawned into a community grazing concept in which I'm funded by Fibershed and Globetrotters Foundation currently to help rural residential communities have the tools and obtain their own animals and share them across and walk them down the road like we just saw in that gorgeous video. It was beautiful so that they are empowered, they get connected to their land, they get connected to their neighbors and it brings everybody together and it makes them safe from fire and it creates more community. I'm also was hired by um, Sonoma SAS Safe School Safe Agriculture to start a new project in West County, which the pilot project to start out there, I have created as the intersectional land stewardship model for fire fuel load reduction, community grazing cooperatives, cultural burning for healthy fire safe and climate smart land stewardship. And to lead into that, I want to do a quick land honoring. Uh, where I graze and live is in Pengrove, which is the home of the coastal Miwok. And the two indigenous peoples that are helping us in our trans intersectional land stewardship is Clint McKay, who lives in Sonoma County. He is a descendant of the Dry Creek, Pomo, Wapo, Northern Sierra Miwok, and Hay Fork, Wintoon Native American tribes. And he's a great participant, and he's a great collaborator, and he's a great leader in this project. The other person is Peter Nelson who's a coastal Miwok and tribal citizen of the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. Again, another great collaborator on this project. They're guiding us in appropriate stewardship on the land that their people have lived on forever. So we're going to move on to the panelists now. I'm gonna start with Guido, you're gonna go first. So you can go ahead and do your land honoring. And then I love to hear, tell me about your unique grazing operation and how you became a grazer. What led you to this life? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the great introduction. Uh, thank you, Evan, for organizing this um, and all the other people involved in uh, making this event free uh, and uh, accessible to everybody. So thank you for that space. Uh, so the lands that we tend um, and also my home base is uh, on Coast Miwok territory, um, unceded. And um, 
We are currently working with Peter Nelson and Nick Tippon with the uh, Federated Indians of Grand Rancheria um, in a non-official uh, manner. We are still uh, learning about the governance practices and how to interact um, with the tribe, but um, they're very active and extremely wanting to collaborate. So it's been exciting to try to work um, with the local Marin RCD and Truegrass Farms and uh, the Federated Indians of Grand Rancheria to um, integrate practices and work on um, our carbon farm plan um, that uh, describes participation, uh, community carbon and cultural ecology as part of uh, us moving forward in the practices we do. Um, Truegrass Farms started approximately eight, nine years ago. I've been, uh, on land and participant in land-based practices and animals for the last 14 years. That is how I've met Brittany. That's how I've met you, Sarah, how I've met John just recently out in Nicasio. Um, and uh, grass has mostly led me. So the cows have led me to what I've learned uh, thus far. And uh, my relationship to place has been through their eyes and their rumen to say it simply. Um, so I um, started as a, a farmhand 14 years ago and slowly worked my way up. Uh, it was on family property. I had a great aunt, never had kids. Uh, I was one of the few nephews, the only nephew that uh, wanted to help. Uh, I worked for her for 10 years. Um, after her passing, um, I was lucky enough to have um, worked out an agreement to hold on to a parcel of land in West Marin County um, and closer to Mollis. And so that's our home base. And from there, we have, for the last four years, uh, actively looked at creating relationships with different landowners uh, to graze our cows um, in an ecological manner um, and to get the landowners, you know, linked back in, participant in the process of the seasonality of their land, but also to understand the interconnectivity of their piece of their parcel and their piece of land within a broader context and within the watershed. And uh, really now expanding into more than just the animal grass relationship, but really looking at this as a holistic community endeavor of uh, managing a watershed as a whole. So, um, I'm very excited to be here and uh, speak more to those points. Thank you, Guido. Cool, I'm handing it over to you. Please let me know if you need to repeat the question, but I think you've got it. No, I got it. Um, got it. Gosh, uh, honor and a privilege to be with all y'all on this panel, such a phenomenal group and best of friends and collaborators right here. So hands up um, for my people. I manage and steward land in the Ojai Valley uh, land of the Ventureño Chumash people. And as a new steward of a beautiful 240 acre um, parcel of land, I have been working to understand the historical significance of the activities that took place in the land. And it's my understanding it was a, um, the original village side of the Chumash in the Ojai Valley. So it's a very special place. And I'm working with uh, the local uh, cultural historical uh, consultant of the county, who's also Chumash woman, um, to understand this, you know, the history of place and um, how it can continue stewarding this land in such a way that honors the past and um, preserves and restores um, its ecological integrity and its it, it, it has a sacred place. Um, what makes me and my outfit unique? Well, I've worked in, uh, I've worked as a land steward and uh, self-deemed shepherdess. I actually made a business card that said shepherdess before I even really got like cut my teeth as a shepherdess because I knew immediately I'm like, this is it. I'm a shepherdess of um, animals, people, and projects um, over a decade ago. Um, I, I would say, you know, similar to Guido, I, I don't, I'm a first generation agrarian. I don't come from this background. And um, I would say that 
my path has been a wild and meandering one because I've always been a, a black sheep or a crazy goat rather and um, exploration to understand how I can contribute to as many lives and as many acres as possible in this lifetime and it's such a rapidly developing world that kind of led me to this work. Um, I first, uh, well, so I'm first generation agrarian. I'm a queer woman and I am, um, also working in a place that it's incredibly hard without a lot of resources to start doing this. So um, I would say that's a unique start. Um, my pathway, I was um, an adventure of the world and really passionate about pres uh, cultural preservation and ecology and studied agroecology. Um, and that led me to becoming an employee and a project manager of a contract grazing business that was um, ignited from Star Creek Ranch and now is Star Creek Land Stewards and worked um, as the project manager into understanding the grazing practices through the transference of knowledge and wisdom of the wonderful people I've worked with from multi-generation Basque uh, sheep family and uh, the wonderful Peruvian sheep herder. So um, through that experience, I became really passionate about how uh, other people like myself without this background could get into this. So that kind of led me into education and advocacy and the search for um, how more people can come into this. And that led me on some really wonderful adventures with Guido exploring how in Spain and France, um, next generation of shepherds are being trained and taught. And it's really not just the academic in, in the classroom type of work, but it's really the transference of knowledge and wisdom. And um, on my long, on my, this long journey, um, working with nonprofit organizations and really trying to find my place and how I can contribute to this next generation, I've um, been building to this moment where I am now my own um, owner operator of Shepherdess Land and Livestock. And um, so I would say I've worn a lot of different ha hats on this and everybody's journey is different and it's not always straightforward. Um, so for those who are meandering, keep on meandering because you'll find it. Thank you, Cole. And I agree, like it, it's, it's a, it, it can be a long twisty road, but keep walking it because it's a really delightful road to walk, you know, just be patient. John, you're up next. Tell us about you. Good morning. And thank you for having me today and everybody for being here. Um, I reside out in West Marin, Point Reyes Station area, uh, originally for the Coast Miwok. And I so far am just operating and working by myself and would look forward to being able to team up with people in the local area. I got started about five, six years ago with goats when I took a trip to Africa and got hooked on goats and came back and decided that I, I wanted to have a huge goat herd and do fuel reduction work. My background is uh, firefighting and defensible space clearing. Goats are a huge part of that. The main part of it, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to complete the rest of my jobs. So I have been slowly learning bumping my head and doing it again, going along and uh, it's working out really well for me. Great, thanks John. Yeah, I think, you know, we're gonna thanks. go over, move on to some more questions here, but there's a lot, one of the most important pieces here is um, all the different tools that we use in grazing and all the benefits that come with it. it you know, we're talking about land restoration, fire fuel load reduction, but also community building and attachment to the land. So it's, it's so many things in, ingrained in one little activity with animals. So I appreciate you all to be here. I'm gonna switch up who answers the question first. So next, the, the first thing we wanna talk about is grazing for ecological restoration, because again, in the past, there's been a concept that animals on the land are bad for the land or can do damage, where it's really about how you steward them and how we take care of them and how we move them, where they become a huge benefit. So we're gonna go into ecological restoration. I'm gonna start with you, Cole, as you were in the middle of the beginning. 
can you talk about the relationship of grazing and SOM increase and other things like that? Just talk about how you use your animals for ecological restoration. Absolutely. Um, well, we could definitely have a whole, you know, week long session on just this, but my, in my personal experience and learning about how um, livestock are a part of land stewardship, it's, it's really all about our management and how we look at a piece of land, understanding what our capabilities and capacity is for our um, livestock, how, how the management and prescription we give as ecological doctors uh, can do pretty awesome things. Um, one, of the, one of the most um, important pieces right now in my work is understanding the soils on the land base that I work in and, and really in, in the face of drought, trying to understand how my land management with uh, sheep and goats, I have 300 head, how that can increase um, the soil organic matter so we can increase our um, water holding capacity. And with every 1% increase of soil organic matter on an acre, that acre of land is able to retain another 20,000 gallons. So, you, you know, my eyes are on the prize. The way I, the way we need to, to build the soil is to feed the microbes and the livestock through their own trampling of the vegetation, oxidized stuff going on above in, in grasses and forbs and whatnot. Those microbes eat that carbon um, and, and, as long as those microbes are happy um, and, and, and uh, thriving, then we're building that soil that we need to increase um, that water retention. So back to management, it's all about timing, uh, how long the duration and how many animals are um, uh, the density of the animals. And so we mimic through using electric fences, but also in, um, uh, my operation, we're using dogs to uh, go out on grazing circuits um, once a day, um, using dogs in, in, uh, to create that predator prey pressure so we can move those animals in a high enough density and move them quick enough um, to, to give the impact that we would like to see. So um, managing livestock can do so many epic things, but it starts with the soil and our water, our water cycles, our mineral cycles are all a part of that. And so we, um, again, understanding what, what our animals can do, what are the appropriate uh, species, uh, what are the appropriate breeds, those are all pieces mm -hmm. to um, how we make our decisions on the land. Great. Thank you, Cole. And John, I'm going to go to you next, as you do a lot of work with watershed health and, you know, can you talk about your watershed health, what you do with your goats, restoration, biodiversity increase that you see, and also maybe tie that into a little bit of the wildfire work or wildfire fuel reduction work. Uh, yes, I, I work heavily in riparian zones where other animals might have a too heavy of an impact on. Um, I work alongside uh, dams and reservoir areas to reduce the fuel loads mainly is my main thing. Um, and I am practicing and learning everything as I go. Yeah, we all do that, that's for sure. I, I even with me and my animals, every time I do something, there's this constant evolution. You're constantly paying attention and saying, oh, that worked, that didn't work, and there's an evolution to it. Thank you, John. Yes. Lito, can you talk about um, how do we increase the value in the work we do as grazers? And how do we increase our value beyond just food production? I realize this is a little bit more than ecological restoration, but <laughs> I took you to a whole new place. So never mind, just talk about what you do with your cows and your ecological restoration, and I'll take that next question next. Because you no, do a I, lot. I, I, I think I, I do like that question a lot. Um, I wanted Big to acknowledge ball. the video that we watched um, <clears throat> is uh, or was uh, a, a movement during COVID um, 
And we were organizing for a few years a festival called the Transhumans Festival. And it was moving sheep from one contract to another downtown Petaluma. And that was with Sweetgrass Grazing with Aaron Gilliam and Paige Trotter. Um, that video was shot actually a similar day where we had the festival scheduled, but then it ended up not happening due to COVID restrictions. Um, but we still were able to shoot a video. And uh, unfortunately, since then, Aaron Gilliam has left our area and we have lost a really incredible shepherd. Um, he is in Washington and he's in love. Uh, so we wish him the best, but uh, he tried for seven years to uh, find a place and fit in. And so we, we do, it, it's, it is hard to make a living at this. And I just want to, um, within the constructs that we have, um, and I think that plays into the conversation about ecology. We, we cannot forget the way we commodify certain aspects of nature and forget about others. And so I think our work to value um, our own work and how and what we do is to kind of switch and uh, highlight um, certain ecological aspects that we take for granted, like clean water, like pollination, uh, some of the most, but open space and uh, our own idea of like recreation and spirituality um, that I think are often forgotten about. Uh, but most importantly, and you know, on that note, the, the idea of being surrounded by biodiversity uh, is underrated because we, we learn so much. I've learned so much with seeing the cows relating to place and then that, me observing them, mimicking and understanding like ecological processes in the meantime, but it is extremely informative. But if I'm only using cows and looking at grass, you know, I'm, I'm losing a lot more data, more information that I could be collecting. So the more that we can nurture biodiversity, the more feedback, like instantaneous feedback we would be getting as people, but also that tickles more of our senses and it helps us relate to place. And it really does give us a type of psychological uh, healthcare that I think a lot of us uh, don't have access to. Um, and I think that is probably one of the biggest steps forward that as we acknowledge the, the healthcare benefits of living in a healthy environment, uh, and not just air quality and water quality, but literally like a biodiverse, active participatory environment where we are constantly stimulated and we are constantly engaged and learning, like that creates like um, a pretty um, substantial, um, I think, uh, <laughs> decrease in healthcare costs in general. Um, so anyway, I, that's speaking to the way we can acknowledge um, that. And the other one is acknowledging our past and the way we, we have fragmented our landscapes to a point where we have forgotten interconnectivity and the ability to work together. So even though we're managing parcels of land, you know, private property is only a couple hundred years old. So, you know, wildlife don't know that, grasses don't know that, climate change doesn't know that. So. We, we have to remind ourselves that working together in a watershed type mindset is the, the movement of valuing this work. And we need people like John, like Cole to, and many others, you know, to in interpret the signs of what's happening and give us that information. I mean, that's, we hire experts, and so people owning land, not necessarily, they're act actively managing it. So we need people that are actively engaged and participant in the land. Um, so I think that would help inform value. Thank you, Guido. I gave you a big one and you, you, that was a home run. Great well, he, he, he did a good job at kind of going into the societal benefits at, that in so many layers and, and ecology and, and equality in society also brings that balance back into ecology because uh, we all need to be a part of the societal um, ecological solutions. Um, so take, it will take all kinds of people. And I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the philosophy that Guido always brings. In. Yes. He's a great philosopher and I appreciate his perspective. And I do think for ecological restoration, we, we, I love 
all of you are very community oriented, mentoring, working together. It's very collaborative. And that's how we get the cultural shift in valuing ecological restoration, because the more people witness it and experience it, like Guido say, and feel better, live healthier, the more value add there is, and the more we can see that and witness that. I'm going to take us a little bit in a different direction, because I do think time flies and we have so much to talk about, but there are people on here that want a little more technical feedback from us, and I think we should give that. So let's go to the place where we're like, a day in the life of a contractor. Like, what is it like for your day? How long does it take to set up fencing? Where do you get the fencing? Um, do you deal with predation issues? How do you take care of those issues? What is your life like as a grazer? And uh, Cole, I'll go with you first. Cole, I'm gonna try to answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A while I yeah. go through the day in the Great. life. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. The deeper I get into being an entrepreneur and a business person, the further away from the land and animals I get. So it's a balance in, in, um, in, in still doing what we love on the ground and why we do it. Um, but on the as an entrepreneur in the business end, um, liability is a really big issue in our work because we're taking animals in you know, stressful, um, high-risk areas. Um, insurance is a, uh, it's expensive and the insurance industry, it doesn't quite know where to put us if we do not have our own ranches that we insure. So, um, I, my business is qualified as a business, a service providing business. So I have general liability and professional liability for any consultation that I also provide. So that's something to think about, um, the great the, the the individual who owns the animals needs to be the one responsible for that insurance and maybe Sarah you can go into a little bit about insurance with a community supported yeah. um, neighborhood grazing um, deal. Um, I'm going to answer another day in the life uh, piece safely fencing that takes a lot of uh, <laughs> You have to become an electrical wizard and understand how electricity moves through our fences. And um, that's a very big, big piece of our work um, for protection, predation, things like that. So we use uh, electric netting in many cases. Sometimes it's poly wire. Um, we work with 300 head and graze anywhere from an acre to three acres uh, paddocks. Um, and Pricing services, it is, that's an art itself. Uh, you, we do site assessments, we do a preliminary call, we do a little bit of education in our calls. And then if it's uh, something that could be a fit, then we go and do a site assessment. And then there's a, a list of variables and conditions that we basically uh, use as a uh, quantify, you know, how it's going to impact the bid and quote for any given project. So there is no, um, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's no rule of thumb there, but I do have to say, I visited with the NRCS yesterday and for equip grants, they are giving landowners now cost share of up to a thousand dollars per acre for targeted grazing for invasive species management. So the NRCS is, is really seeing our value as, as targeted contract grazers. So a thousand bucks an acre is not far off. And, and our cost to run our operations is huge. And no one's doing me a favor by saying, hey, I got like 40 acres. It's that my operation is specific to providing a service versus um, growing food or fiber. Um, so that's that's how you know uh, different targeted grazing businesses can differ. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I think- Thank we'll you, Cole. That. Thank you, Cole, I appreciate it. John, I'm gonna go to you next. Um, can you talk a little bit about, first of all, I, I think that's one big question. If you're interested in becoming a contract grazer, like how do I know what to charge? If you can kind of, I, and every site's different, but kind of walk us through like how you go to a site, how you examine it and how you kind of know how to charge. And then like how, you know, the setting up the fence, like the day in the life of your, of your contract business. That'd be great. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, let's see, a day in the life. Um, getting up early, thinking about what the day is going to bring in wonderful ways and heading out to where the goats are, whatever field or property that is, and 
checking on them first thing in the morning, saying hi to them. They say hi back. <laughs> and uh, I get going with my day, depending on what needs to be tackled that day. If, if it's a day that I'm moving them, it's a pretty big day. If it's just a day of uh, checking them and monitoring how they're doing the vegetation load, then it's, it makes it a little bit easier and I can go off and do some other projects for the day. Um, going out to a property, I, I do quarter acre on up to a few acres. Uh, I try to do it in about half acre increments so I can really get the goats that I have on there and clear up as much as I can. Um, the zone that I'm grazing is from ground level up to six feet. So that way you can easily walk underneath it. So there's, there's a lot of work to do in that. Um, I, so I head out, I do site walks and love to talk to homeowners and educate them on goats and how wonderful it is to have them in their yard and how much uh, animal therapy they'll get for free if I come out. <laughs> and so let's see, um, fencing, energizers, water. Mm -hmm. That's all uh, stuff that I had to figure out. Uh, just as coal, I use uh, electric fence netting. Uh, it's about the only thing I found that is somewhat goat proof. And I then run a really uh, hot shock energizer to make sure that it's mainly to keep predators out and then the goats feel safe and they stay in. Um, water is another thing. Not all sites have water and having to bring that in is sometimes uh, more difficult than others, but typically, uh, you know, something that is always feeding them fresh, clean, cold water is the most important thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, John. It's perfect. And Guido, on to you. And you have cows, uh, which is a different animal. Could you talk about the size that you need that that works for you, like your minimal size to take your cows? How you, you know, day in the life of you as a grazer, and how you assess a job and a site and and charge. Like if you can kind of give an overview of it, that would help. Thank you, Guido. Uh, yeah, and I want to be honest. Like I. Uh... I'm able to do this full time because I do have a piece of land to base myself on. And uh, this has been actually a conversation that Aaron and I had is like, you know, I do some of the work uh, for free, but that is also in exchange for like longer term leases or zero sum leases. So mm -hmm. um, I think John and Cole are much better suited at answering certain questions, but uh, I have cows, I'm finding land. I, it's very hard to find land as a young person. So like through desperation, I am grazing properties that are very hard to graze, usually have no fences and no water. So I think this is where maybe I can speak to the technicalities of like learning how to use gravity system, bringing tanks portable. And with cows, you know, we're looking at like hundreds of gallons per day. So you can't just haul it in. You're really like looking at creating semi-permanent uh, or modular systems in order to get water, which I agree with John, is the most limiting factor for most people. Once you figure the water, the rest becomes easy. I mean, fences, I'm sure goats are incredibly hard. Cows, I use one line. That's all I can afford. Uh, so it's really a lot about keeping them happy and working with your animals and teaching them uh, how to graze what is available. So we manage primarily coastal shrub and prairie. So our cows for the last seven years have been selected for fertility and also just um, being able to eat on what they have. Uh, our average weights have gone down from 1100 pounds to 950. So lighter looking cow. Um, we calve in spring, trying to match their nutritional demand, which is huge. That has released a lot of pressure from our mothers, uh, from lice in winter to uh, milking to like healthier calves with no pneumonia. Um, so it's just, it, it's really like a lot of small little factors that take actually time to get to. Um, like I think contractor grazer knows, like not all goats are created equal. Like finding the ones that are trained to electric fence, that have gone through hell, that can still maintain fertility, that have good hooves. Like these are all things you wanna look for. Like, and that's what I've been training my cows to do. So 
you know, mine have horns, they look different. You know, I, I, if I went to an auction, I definitely would not make my money back, but they hold their value in gold for me because they're highly adaptable. They eat what they can. They're incredible mothers. And, you know, what I tell the landowners that we work with in these leases that we have is that it's, again, making them relate to their land, but also like it's food. They, they have access to food. They have access to somebody that's on their land constantly. And that ability, like I said, to uh, think of their space in a much different manner. Um, and that, that, that in itself creates value. And I think the ability for some of us that have access to these landowners is being like, hey, being honest, like I can't do everything with cows. I think you should use this element. And I think diversifying from different disturbances from brush cutting to using goats, using sheep, using cattle, um, every landscape and every mo type of disturbance, you know, lends itself to a particular um, service provider. Thank you, Guido. Can you just quickly talk about how you get the water to your cows? Do you have a, a system that you've created? Because that's that's a huge advantage if you've created that. So, you know, I'd love to hear that if you have one moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I learned a lot from um, Aaron Lucich that grazes Pepperwood Preserve. Uh, he came out with a pretty cool modular system and um, it's really just cam locks and one inch uh, poly tubing and 300, 500 foot lengths. Um, those are coils that you can drag quite easily without getting them stuck. 100 PSI is plenty. Um, Google Earth is an incredible tool to understand elevation differences, your PSI buildup, where you have to break uh, for you know, pressure releasing and understanding flow. Um, mm -hmm. With a one inch pipe, you can pretty much handle up to 100 cows. And um, then it's just about trough size and tank sizes. Um, springs, you know, even bank grazing, depending the time of the year. Um, so it's a modular system, the cam locks or banjo cam locks. Um, and um, okay. all this is available online, unfortunately, all different places. Um, and the other one is, uh, you know, small little technological improvements. Um, if you don't have a landowner that lives on the property, just but, you know, that can like check the water, uh, because that's the main disaster problem is like when you run out of water, that's mm -hmm. when the animals are going to get out. Yeah. So we, we use fence alarm. It's a um, device that sends me a text message if the voltage drops. It's useful if you get used to it. It also can cause a lot of stress as you're always checking it. Um, so that's why I mean really checking your water, knowing your system is working, having really calm animals. So when they do get out, you can get them back in. And that's, that, that is a huge part of the relational part. Um, but I'm happy to answer more questions if anybody yeah. has them later and they can contact me. Thank you, Guido. And I will speak to that. We, we will be sending out an email with all, everybody's contact information here. Um, all of us are happy to answer any questions. All of us are happy to, to mentor and be support systems for new grazers. Um, I'm just going to speak really briefly to community grazing cooperatives and, and hopefully answer some of the questions. I haven't looked at all of them. But with the cooperatives, there's a couple of different models. One of the model that seems to be working most in the new cooperatives is the, the flock is shared or the flirt. It's generally sheep, a flirt is sheep and goats for, for me, but it's either sheep or sheep and goats. And sometimes it's just goats as we're going into West County, we're going into real forested area, like what John's working in West Marin in which goats do the best work. Um, so we have shared fencing, shared power units, shared animals. There's, there's like a cooperative buy-in and then you're all a participant. Every, when it's a cooperative and it's the shared flirt or herd, each member will reach out to their own insurance provider and have their insurance when the animals are on their property. So you're not adding extra insurance to the overhead of that cooperative. Um, and some of the cooperatives are making their money back by selling lamb for meat or by selling off animals. I am an assistant there. I, I have funding to assist people because like what Guido was talking about and is really a critical piece is having the right animals for your situation, having healthy animals that know how to graze, that have good feet, that know this fencing, that are easy to move when you're new to animals is so critical and we can help you find those right animals. So the cooperative is real, all parties coming in together and financially working together and cooperatively working together as they move the animals around. It really creates a community. 
And we're advancing it in the West County to where they have a disaster plan for the whole community. They know how to get out. If they have um, limited people in their community, like disabled or elderly, everybody has a way of being taken care of. We know that nobody in that community is gonna be left behind, that they are safe as an entity, not as individuals. So I hope that answers that question a little bit. Um, and we, one thing I really would like to talk about real quickly, again, we're running out of time, is one of the biggest things, issues right now for, for us in California and a lot of places is fire, wildfires. So I want us to be able to touch really quickly, again, we don't have a whole lot of time, but how are you grazing for wildfire prevention? Because grazing for wildfire prevention is huge, it's critical. There's actually much more awareness of it and there's funding through CAL FIRE. So how can you explain the importance of grazing for wild, wildfire prevention? And I'm gonna to go to you, Cole, first, so go ahead. Okay, I'll dash through this. So there's a lot of public demand for alternatives to traditional uh, chemical use for vegetation management. So as public is saying, hey, decision makers don't use chemical, what are the alternatives? That's creating the pressure and momentum to, for, for these decision makers and land managers and owners to look towards grazers. It's up to us to do the job that is needed to, to, to outperform that chemical. And that's all based off of our management and understanding, again, of our animals and how we design and prescri prescribe our grazing uh, services. Um, so I actually really want to quickly just share my screen so you can see um, a really good example of uh, defensible space. So up on the top left, that is a whole row of home. It's a homeowners association up in the Bay Area. That's like 300 feet or so. I can't fully tell of defensible space. That's about 400 animals moving uh, over close to two acres a day um, in that area. So um, we can do a lot. And the more decision makers understand uh, the efficacy and the value of what we do, um, we're gonna be able to have uh, more impact. We need more grazers, we need more public education, and we need more people from grassroots bottom level advocating and you know screaming for changes um, to bring in alternatives to the traditional vegetation management solutions. So public awareness is a huge part of that. And um, we can all advocate um, as, taxpayers um, and community members for grazing as an, a solution. Thank you, Cole. I think you, you the, the critical piece there is too, is this ties into the ecological restoration because grazing for fire fuel load reduction actually is good for the ecosystem as well. It's non-toxic, the synthetic chemicals are causing all of this damage and they don't actually do a very good job of fire prevention. So where the grazing animals do a really critical job, they come in and do the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So Guido, I'm gonna hand this over to you. Can you talk a little bit about grazing for fire fuel load production or, or wildfire safety? Um, I, because of the, um, the partial subdivision and where people live, it, it, I think the fires that we used once see, the cultural burns are, you know, are much harder to put in place because of how densely we live in California, especially around the Bay Area. So I think it's actually really important to have smaller scale grazers in place to be managing little spots and having these burns of like a blackberry bush and like working with your local like good fire alliance or tribe to be able to like have you know cultural practical burns within neighborhoods so there's a better understanding of what these practices can look like and that they they all work in symbiosis and together so i think for us it's really just been working with a landowner the landowner building trust with that landowner and then us bringing different people in, um, like I've been working with Jared Childress and the Good Fire Alliance and just trying to like, like yeah, let's do this. And it, it gives, it creates opportunity. Um, and that's that's been my experience it, it, regarding the fire. If the soil has more water, if there's more diversity, um, if there's more natives, natives have, you know, the all native grasses and trees have evolved with fire in California over millions of years. So. Um, it's they're, they're structurally sound when it comes to lower degree burns. Um, 
as long as we maintain the, the fuel uh, reduced. So that's been my experience. Thank you, Guido. Okay, John, I'm gonna hand this over to you and you're an excellent one to answer because you're a firefighter and you're using grazing for fire fuel fuel load reduction. So could you speak to this, the using gra grazers for this purpose? Uh, yes, uh, specifically on being able to do small, small parcels very intensely going from neighbor to neighbor because if one neighbor does it and the rest don't, <clears throat> it's not helping out the neighborhood. Right. So um, that, that's mainly it coming in and reducing the fuels, the ladder fuels specifically, so we don't get fires that are in the grass all of a sudden running into the canopies. Um, my background's got pretty heavy on fire side being a volunteer firefighter and for over 10 years and learned everything on that side and cutting a lot of hand line. And I realized that goats could help out quite a bit and mm -hmm. between the goats and myself you know go through and what we can't clear with the goats then a wood chipper comes in behind and cleans up gets all that carbon on the ground where it needs to be thanks john and in your instance where you're doing yeah. it in the forest you're you're doing work as well like you said the goats can come do some stuff but sometimes you actually have to cut down and do some mechanized work and chipping to open it up for to be able to withstand a fire yeah, correct. Together. Between, yep, yep. Doing a fuel reduction compared to fire line clearing, where we just reduce all the ladder fuels to where there's not much to burn compared to scratching or going down to almost bare soil to where nothing can burn at all. There's a few different techniques of doing that, depending on what you're trying to protect. Okay, thanks, John. I want we we have a couple of minutes left, and I want to use them because I yeah. um I would like all of you again. I have to say quickly, as you know, to speak to how do we connect as grazers? How do we support each other? How do we create mentoring with each other? And can people reach out to you for mentoring and skills and collaborative work? Because grazers we're all out all over the place. How do we collaborate and become a community ourselves to support each other who've been doing it for a while and those who are new to it? Uh, Guido, you're first. <laughs> uh, in, in the words of uh, Aaron Lucich, you know, ruthlessly collaborative. Uh, so in a way where if we can share, um, I, I, I know many people that, you know, we're struggling to find land. I'm currently looking for land and it, it brings up some animosity when somebody else is also looking for land. So the idea is like, there's though places that like, I don't actually need to graze, they're too far away. And I have found maybe two years ago and maybe something's gonna come up up here. So if we're more able to share and if we're more able to like, you know, communicate and be like, let why don't you manage that? And Aaron Gilliam, myself and Aaron Lucich, uh, Byron Palmer even coming around, like we, we have been trying to mm -hmm. uh, work on that aspect. And it's, you know, it, it's an ongoing conversation and it's a, uh, something that I think would help a lot newcomers coming on. There's like these smaller projects to get your feet wet, understand how hard, how beautiful it can be. Uh, and then, you know, move on to um, managing because otherwise larger outfits will be coming into every county. And I think there is value in the efficiency of a larger outfit. And also we have to remain somewhat true to the community that also needs that type of work within their own space, because that's part of also respecting, you know, and how do we like almost re-indigenize to a place to, to, to know it. And uh, I think it is important to sometimes, you know, we don't have to be that efficient, but just as long as we're effective in mm -hmm. the nature of our process, um, we can, um, yeah, we, we, we can make this place quite abundant. And yeah. it's going to be necessary. Um, I agree. Letting go of efficiency and letting go of the feelings of scarcity will help us in our collaboration and our mentoring. It's 12 o'clock. I'm sorry, Cole and John, you didn't get to answer that unless you want to. Okay, great. We want to respect everyone's time by ending on time. Um, I want to thank the panelists. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to get this time to chat with you and to see you all because I haven't seen most of you in a long time. 
thank you for the attendees and thank you for the sponsors for making this available and making this available for free. Uh, to let you all know who are there observing, a workshop evaluation will be linked and will also be sent in a follow-up email. Uh, please share your thoughts. We want your feedback. Feel free to reach out to any of the panelists, including myself, with questions, concerns, mentoring, thoughts. That's why we're here. We all really do support each other. Um, please go and visit the virtual hall, expo hall and support the people that allowed us to have this program for free, free and to be here. And if you have, uh, you can have the money, please donate to the small farm conference. It has been great he being here. It was great to spend this time with all of you. I wish you a wonderful day to enjoy the sunshine and get out grazing. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye, Cole. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, Bye John. Bye, Guido.